Good morning, Rubicon. The Warriors are here, 9 o'clock Saturday morning. So great to see a full room. I also want to thank the IT guys. Because I was listening yesterday to the music coming up for speakers, and I thought Jill LaMarche was going to play a trick on me, because, you know, I'm a Canadian, so I'm pretty level-keeled, calm kind of guy. And I thought maybe he was going to have him play Neil Diamond or Neil Sedaka or something. So I went up to the sound guy and I said, no, no, do you got any Rush, man? And the sound guy goes, Rush? Yeah, man, it's my second favorite band. And I go, second favorite, dude? It's my favorite band. See, as a Canadian, Rush is in our blood. And it's going to be hard for you to picture this, I know. But go back, 1975 in Toronto. Russia was just breaking onto the scene, right? They had just had their big first concert with Working Man down in Cleveland, and I was in grade nine in high school. So we're too young to drink and get into bars, but we used to hang out at the Knob Hill in Scarborough all the time because Rush played there all the time. So picture this, long hair, Howick wide leg jeans with the star sewn on the ass, white, canvas Converse Chuck Taylors, and we're all hanging outside the Knob Hill because we can't get into it, trying to listen to Rush, and when the door would open and the cloud of smoke would come out, we'd all be looking to see if we could see who was on stage. It's such a great band. But that particular song has a great verse in it, and the verse says this, we want to believe in the freedom of music but glittering prizes and endless compromises shatter the illusion of integrity. And I listen to that and I go, it's such an, a meaningful metaphor for chiropractic for me. So what I wanna to do today is talk about the fact that we get together here in these rooms and we celebrate and we party and we pat each other on the back and we have a great time giving each other awards but as we move forward with a conversation professionally about what it is we embrace, we have some gaps in continuity in our conversation and our metaphors and the integrity of what it is we're talking about, and that's the mission for us. So I'm also grateful that it was rushed because I am a laid back kind of Canadian, so that's about as energetic as the next 45 minutes is gonna get. <laughs> it's just my affect, folks. I wanted to come out and bounce around, but it's just not me. But I want you to know something. I feel inside as if I have a 12-year-old cheerleader doing a routine, but it just doesn't come out on the surface. <laughs> this is it. This is it. And the other disclosure is this. For the next 45 minutes, my job is not to entertain you, and it's not going to be to inspire you, although I hope you're inspired. I really want to do is to get you to think about what it is we're here for, the purpose behind the Rubicon, and why this conversation is so fundamentally important to the viability and survival of chiropractic and the profession as we know it. So here's my projection, my crystal ball. I'm gonna go out on the limb here and say that I believe and predict that the Rubicon group and these conferences are gonna be the single most important and impactful event that has happened to the neo-vitalistic, neurologically centered, traditional chiropractic, no drugs and surgery movement in our profession. And I'm thankful for you being here and having this conversation. My world is a political world. Obviously, I'm in charge of running the operations of Life University, but I spend a lot of time in conferences and discussions about chiropractic. And we're here talking about a concept that's a core value of the Rubicon, of neo-vitalism. But I gotta tell you, we love it. We embrace it. It's a kind of an underpinning of everything we believe in. But the minute you walk out the door and get off of Chiropractic Island, it's not exactly a well-embraced concept. Would you agree? So we have a challenge with bridging that gap professionally to be able to move the conversation forward. Here's an example of what I talk about. This is by Craig Nelson and his group. They published this over, well, quite a while ago, 2005, but you get a sense of what it is. A number of models are impractical, implausible, or even indefensible from a purely scientific point of view. Example, subluxation-based healthcare. 
from a professional practice perspective, example, the primary care model, or simply from common sense, innate intelligence as an operational system for influencing health. They go on to say, while vitalism is incompatible with a valid professional model of chiropractic, it is not incompatible with an individual chiropractor's professional beliefs. An individual physician of any type may have religious convictions that inform their professional lives, and yet these convictions remain totally outside the domain of a profession's common identity. Similarly, an individual chiropractor's belief or non-belief in vitalism can be considered to be entirely a personal matter so long as these beliefs do not distort the discharge of one's professional duties and obligations. It gets you the warm and fuzzies, doesn't it? And I gotta tell you, I know and Craig for a long time. He's a bright, articulate, thoughtful researcher. He worked at Northwestern Health Sciences University in their department there. In fact, he worked there when I was the dean of the College of Chiropractic. Not coincidentally enough, I was the dean of the College of Chiropractic from 2000 to 2005 at the time that we were trying to reintroduce these concepts into Northwestern's curriculum. So there might have been a little bit of discomfort around this messaging as it came out, but here's my favorite one. Vitalism has been relegated to the trash heap of history. Unless you are prepared to declare that the world is flat and the sun is a fiery chariot pulled by winged horses, unless, in other words, your defiance of modern science is quite complete, you won't find anywhere to stand to fight these obsolete ideas. Clearly, the concept of vitalism has a challenge breaking into the marketplace. I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm not a fan of the word. You don't have to look very far into the dictionaries to hear things like it died the death of a thousand cuts because of its historical perspective and place in the evolution of scientific thought and methods. So we're trying to take a concept that literally has been outcast from the vast majority of people in our communities and reconstruct it, rebrand it, and redefine it into a term of neo-vitalism or the new vitalism. And we have to understand that there's a rationale and a logic behind how we can move forward as a collective group within Rubicon and you folks as individual practitioners to know where that is in practice and how it affects the practice of chiropractic. Does that make sense? This is a document out of Europe, the Clinical and Professional Chiropractic Education, a positional statement. It's very recent. And I want you to really just look, there were several points in this document, but this was point number five that I've emphasized for you. The teaching of vertebral subluxation complex is a vitalistic construct that claims that it is the cause of disease is unsupported by evidence. Its inclusion in modern chiropractic curriculum in anything other than a historical context is therefore inappropriate and unnecessary. Signed by many, many colleges in Europe, except for Barcelona College, McTimity College, members of the Rubicon Group, who think that is pure bullshit. But it's the mindset that we're in. So many years ago, I shared this topic because I was presenting at the WFC, or the ACC conference in Washington, DC, and I was actually on a panel with Lou Sportelli, who's in the room. Several of us were talking about this concept of healthcare, and I gave my presentation, and you've heard this before, but a gentleman in the back of the room, about 400 people, came up to a microphone at the end of the microphone, and he said with, he was mad, mad as heck. He was shaking, he was so angry, and he pointed his finger straight at me and said, you are a threat to humanity. You remember that, Lou? And I said, well, thanks for the statement. There's no question in there, and I, I sat down. But you see, what it brings up is the topic that we can't even enter the conversation about vitalism without people's minds becoming closed like steel traps, simply as the word of it. And it's historical baggage that we're dealing with and moving on with that is creating this problem. So Nelson's criticisms were these. And I'm gonna to suggest to you that at the time these were written, these are still very legitimate criticisms. He said that the criticisms of subluxation-based intelligence approach, it lacked cultural authority, meaning that the public and the profession just didn't embrace it. The vitalistic concept that everybody thought it was based upon had been invalidated 100 years ago, and it had an inappropriate theory of health and disease. 
So our job now to enter back into the conversation is to tackle these legitimate criticisms and say, no, I think we might have some conversation here. How do we adapt to this? You with me? That's our challenge. It's an antiquated classical animist model that's not philosophically viable. And when we talk about that, the, ant the antiquated clinical animist model is one of the life force, which was a very, had a re very religious connotation to it in the 1800s. So we sit here and we say, okay, today, in today's contemporary sciences, is there a way we can bridge this? And there is, but it's not easy. Here's a picture I show to everybody I talk to. It was taken in 1991, I think. It's at the World Congress of Chiropractic Students. It was in, in uh, Bournemouth, England. And the guy in the black and purple, beautiful sweater with the porn mustache and the beer in hand <laughs> is me. And I was a Northwestern student coming from my science background. And I was talking to a gentleman and a young lady, and the guy was from Life University. I wish I knew who he is. If you know who he is, tell him I'd love to track him down because I remember this conversation vividly. You got to have a couple beers when you're having a chiropractic conversation, right? That's where bonding occurs. And we were into this, as you can tell. But I remember exactly what was being said. I was sitting there saying to him, innate intelligence? Why don't you just call it homeostasis because that's what it is? So this is a picture embedded in time in my mind of me having a conversation with great authority, by the way, and I did not have a clue what I was talking about. Didn't have a clue. Because I'd never even been exposed to chiropractic principles and philosophy before. My whole educational experience was none of it. I joked because I didn't even get to know Fred Barge until I started my diplomate in philosophy when I was a, at Northwestern. And when I was a student at Northwestern and Fred would come to our campus, I protested Fred Barge coming to Northwestern. I had picket signs out front saying, keep this crazed lunatic away from our students and our minds. I had no idea what I was talking about. You know, Ayn Rand has this great, this quite great quote. She says, it's often difficult to talk about complex things made even more difficult when you don't know what they are. And that's the challenge in chiropractic is the vast majority of people, practitioners and students in our profession outside of our institutions have never been exposed to a critical intellectual conversation about chiropractic principles and philosophy. They've only heard it in the context of slogans, right? And generally in derogatory terms. That's, our that's the starting point of our conversation. It's not wrong, bad, or indifferent, it just is. Our schools are very parochial in how they approach that. Chiropractic philosophy is an interesting historical antidote, but has no place in contemporary chiropractic education. Bam, you just saw it in a statement, wouldn't you agree? And I'm sitting there going, I didn't even get exposed to chiropractic until I was in practice for 10 years. Principles, never, never even read them until I'd been in practice for 10 years. And they fundamentally changed my life. And I can't, you know, these are pretty rich concepts. We need to be able to figure out how to take these into a meaningful dialogue in the context of contemporary science that's happening all around us and reposition this thing. So that's my journey on this. So what does it all mean? We need to position the concept of neo-vitalism, and maybe we'll come up with a better word for it, but right now that's the one we've got in the marketplace where it's clinically relevant and has a clear value proposition. It's scientifically valid and testable, so a framework for it, and a sound and testable theory. So where do you start? We started at Life University before the Rubicon got together, and we said, you know, this idea of vitalism isn't unique. There are all kinds of constituents that embrace this idea of the self-healing ability of human beings. In fact, it's been around for a long time in the, concept, in the context of vis medicatrix naturae, right? You've all heard that, the healing of nature? So we brought together in a conference at Life University through the Octagon that Dr. Klum oversees, a bunch of people who, are, who embrace this concept. They included, I've got an automatic forward on this slide, Monica Greco, 
who was unfortunately going to be here but couldn't make it this weekend. She's one of the premier philosophers on vitalism from Oxford University. It included uh, um, Christina, I've just gone blank on her name, Kofer, PhD from Systems Theory at MIT. It included Robert Fisher, the, the naturopath to the Queen of England. It included uh, Ian Coulter from the RAND Corporation. It included uh, Abula Gula from University of California, who is the preeminent Ayurvedic medicine individual. It included uh, the gentleman Joe, I've just gone totally blank on his last name, from, from Bastyr University, the head of the naturopathic college and a big influence in the naturopathic profession. And we got everybody together to sit down for two days and present on this topic of vis medicatrix naturae. And then at the second day, they got together in a room and they sat down and they wrote a paper about what this concept is and means. And every one of them in the room walked out the next day and said this, it's a recognition and respect for the self-aware, self-organizing, self-healing ability of human beings. Sound familiar? So vitalism is a philosophical construct that is certainly not unique to chiropractic. It's unique to a whole group of healing profession that gives us a lens on how we look at health. And it's an important lens right now because in our conversations that are happening in the US and certainly around the world, the question we have in chiropractic is this. Is chiropractic simply a therapeutic intervention for pain control within a Western allopathic model of care? Or is chiropractic truly a different way of looking at health that provides consumers a choice, a different choice in how they want to approach their health? And the answer to that question is the fundamental question to move forward. Because if it's simply just a therapeutic modality or approach within conventional Western healthcare, because we're really good at low back pain and neck pain, which by the way, we are, then we can just stick these people in this system that's been built around that model, right? But if it's truly a choice for people that gives them a different way of looking at what constitutes health, then we have to have a different system and different politics and different procedural and ethics standards around that. And that's the stage we're at. Because right now in chiropractic, I could put a table up on this stage. I could bring all those people who are on that list up and I could lay a person down and would bring their leg up on them like this and I'd put my pisiform on a transverse process. You with me? Everybody's doing that. They'll put an external concussive thrust into that joint. Following me? Because a lot of people move bones, folks, and a lot of people can move bones really well, right? Twina, athletic trainers, chiropractors, medical doctors, you can go through this list. Chuna, body workers. And I'm gonna argue that if they put an external concussive thrust into that joint, we could alter the pressures on that joint. Tracking? And if we alter the pressures on the joint, then I would take that further and say, well, then we can decrease the, the stresses acting on the soft tissues of the joint. We could alter the proprioceptive and nociceptive thresholds and firing. And if we take that even further, I would argue that people may get out of pain. You with me? So my question to you is this. If everybody who I just mentioned can move a bone in somebody's back and essentially result in the same outcome, what makes you special? What is it that gives you the right to be licensed as a separate and distinct healing profession all through the United States, Canada, and many countries around the world? And the answer to that question is because we have a separate and distinct model of what constitutes health and disease. We have separate and distinct philosophical principles that underpin that model, and we have a separate and distinct way of providing an intervention in that model. It's not what we do, it's why we do what we do. It's why we do what we do that provides the hope for people, a different way of looking at what constitutes health, and it forms the underlying basis of this concept of a self-organizing, self-conscious, self-maintaining, and self-healing living organism. You start having that conversation with patients, you're having a different conversation than the person who's just hanging a shingle out on their front door. Wouldn't you agree? You're providing them a different conversation. So how does this relate to reframing this concept of vitalism? I've already said that the major premise previously that we were criticized one was an animist model. 
Well, there's other types. This life force has to be reconceptualized into a naturalistic perspective. You see, the life force historically has been a non-physical entity. And we get really caught up in the concept of non-physical. But I'm going to suggest to you that in the new world of quantum physics and quantum mechanics, we need to really reconceptualize what we mean by non-physical. Because in the quantum world, we are continually redefining what nothing is. You know what I mean? So there is a contemporary scientific paradigm that provides us a rational way of approaching the questions that gets us away from the concept of an animated religious theological life force perspective, which works for a lot of people and doesn't work for a lot of people. So how can we bridge that so that everybody can still embrace the concept? So the philosophical, empirically congruent, and conducive with contemporary scientific paradigms of correspondence theory. So I throw correspondence theory out here because this is my pet peeve with chiropractic and research. And if you didn't get a chance to go hear the folks yesterday, absolutely amazing. For those of you who did go, thank you for being there. How do you know something's true, right? We sit around and we listen to speakers provide all this information to us and all this science that we have available to us, but I gotta ask you, how do you know something's true? What is it constitutes the truth? And there's three theories behind truth. One is the coherency theory, that your reality co co is coherent with your version of reality and yours is, but they can be different from each other. Here's my example. How many of you by hand, show of hands, have only lived somewhere in the South? Seriously? Okay, how many of you have lived somewhere where there's snow? <laughs> so the three people from the South, <laughs> bad analogy. Here's the thing, in Atlanta when it snows, I mean, they're stocking up on bread and water, it's on the news for days ahead of time, they're shutting schools down on just the thought of snow. You're all laughing. It's truth, and for those of us who are from the snow areas, I'm from Canada, obviously, we're used to it, snow. I mean, you know how, it's not dangerous, you just have to deal with it, right? Your versions of reality are very different. So the coherency with my own reality is very different from those who are in the South. That's a real issue in healthcare and the evidence for healthcare. The other one is a pragmatic theory. This is kind of hard to explain, but is it important to know something in true, is true because it's right, or is it just important to know it's true, like gravity? It's always good to know that gravity is true because if you happen to walk off the top of a building, you will with total certainty hit the ground, right? So it's good to know that one. And the last one is correspondence theory, and this is where it gets important. Correspondence theory tells us the truth because it allows us to correspond our experiences with everybody else, and the more people who correspond with the same experience, the more likely it is that something's true. You with me? So I can get on a plane in Atlanta, and I can fly to Paris, in September of 19, or 2019, right? And I can go to the Rubicon Conference. I can go from here and I can land at Charles de Gaulle. But here's where it gets really good. Do you know what? You probably could too. And guess what? You could too. And I'm gonna guess everybody in this room could. So our, our experiences are corresponding with each other. When our experiences and observations are corresponding, then we have a higher level of something being true. With me? Doesn't mean it's true. Just means there's a higher probability of something being true. So when we get into the chiropractic weeds on research, I hate with a passion when I hear people say, there's no, there's no evidence to support what you're talking about. And I go, well, first of all, what am I talking about? Right, because most people haven't had the conversation. And secondarily, what do you mean by evidence? because there's different types of evidence, some of which is more on the coherency level, and some of it is on the correspondence level. It provides integrity to the conversations and the decisions we make and the way we position our, our place going forward. It shows up in how we answer questions with the, the legitimacy of our answers based upon the rationale and the collectiveness of the response. Does that make sense to you? I have a little joke about this, so I'll share it with you, and I'm going out on a limb here. Number one rule of public speaking is don't tell jokes. So here it goes. 
So in the early days, of, I've been 24 years of marriage to my bride this, week, this, this summer. And uh, when we were um, dating, getting to know each other, you know how you go through those things where you're, you're trying to figure each other out a little bit, whether this is the right fit? So she was giving me the Spanish Inquisition, and she said, uh, so, do you, uh, you read Playboy magazine? <laughs> and I looked at her and said, uh, well, why, yes, I do. Wanted to be truthful, right? See, position of integrity. And you can imagine the response was, oh, you do? Well, why do you have to read Playboy magazine? Guys? Right? <laughs> so you want to be truthful, right? Because this is a key moment of integrity for you in a relationship that's developing. And I said, well, I'll tell you, I read uh, Playboy magazine for the same reason I read National Geographic. <laughs> to see colored pictures of places I ain't never going to visit. <laughs> right? But it was honest. So after the beatdown, I haven't continued that practice at all. So here's the difference with vitalism. Uh, uh, Richard Dennis uh, is a, a chiropractor out of Australia, has been with the Rubicon off and on, and is doing his PhD in university uh, in, a, in uh, Queensland. And he's talking about vitalism, and you really can't see this well, but if you look at halfway through, it says vitalism and neo-vitalism. The, the left side is the old versions, and it was a spiritual concept. It's outdated. It has religious implications. It was empowering for a lot of people. But it was more than just physical, and the locus of power is internal. And then when you go over to this concept of neo-vitalism, he says it's not just you know, spiritual elements. There's quantum explanations for it. It's contemporary. It's scientific. It's empowering. The physical is energy, and the locus of power stays internal. So we're bridging this concept now of this kind of ethereal place, and we need to reframe vitalism from a classic ontological perspective to a comp contemporary epistemological one. And these are big words, so let me explain what this means to you. This gets to the heart of our challenge with science. Um, epistemology is how we know things to be true. It's scientific methodology, right? And we want science and scientific methodology to be how we know things, because scientific methodology is really powerful, right? It builds the coherence, the, the correspondence theory, if you do it right. It controls for external variables so the outcome you get can actually be meaningful and kind of discussed and interpreted in a more valid manner. But what's happened with science is it's become ontological over the years. And ontology is the nature of reality. It's a metaphysical construct. And we've created scientists um, who are now worshiped. Science is now almost a religiosity because we don't look at it just as a way of knowing, we know it as the way things are. You with me? And scientism, uh, religious scientism has become such a problem in the research community and the way that we look at life in general that we have to revert it. We have to free the shackles of reductionistic methodologies to the way it was intended to be for the sake of inquiry from the way things are. And if you don't fall into that camp, by the way, because they have conferences just like this where these individuals and their PhDs and their MDs come up to platforms wearing their white coats and, and the room is full of their disciples who stand on all the words of the ontological perspective of scientific religion. But, and if you don't embrace that or you question it or you are kind of an outlier to it, they ostracize you. They throw you out of their club, right? We had a couple speakers with us this weekend who have experienced that. You know, Bruce Lipton experienced that at University of Wisconsin Medical School. Andrew Wakefield has experienced the wrath of religious scientism. Because if you question it the way you should be questioning it, in an epistemological perspective, they outcast you. So we have to reframe that conversation. And the way we reframe it is in the context of complexity theory. So complexity theory is this. Hey, obviously, Tim, Dr. Gross's brain is a complex thing. OK, I won't use that as an example. <laughs> Dr. Gross's brain is complex. And there's no arguing the human brain is complex. But we're not talking about 
the complexity of, of a brain, for instance. We're talking about complexity from a different perspective. And complexity theory, which is Isabella Strenger, a contemporary German philosopher, says that complexity suggests that no single or simple set of questions may be treated as a generalizable norm in terms of yielding relevant answers. So we're questioning this concept of reductionism where something can be broken down into its smallest fundamental parts, which is the heart of scientific inquiry. She goes on to say that complexity suggests that the concept of reductionism and the desire to produce a form of knowledge that's exhaustive and deterministic does not make sense. Because complexity theory suggests that it doesn't matter how much you know, you can always break it down further. It's more complex. And quantum theory suggests the same thing, right? The atom is not the smallest element of something anymore that old theory would do. Dr. Lipton spoke yesterday about entanglement when he was talking about genes and biology and how you just can't be so simplistic to think this way because there's so much entanglement to know what's going on in a living organism. So this rethinks how we look at life. It demands that we acknowledge and learn to value as a source of quantitatively new questions the possibility of a form of ignorance or lack of knowledge that cannot possibly defer to future knowledge. That's kind of an enlightening position to take, isn't it? It says, you know, we're just on the verge of really knowing what it is the power of the chiropractic adjustment has on the physiology of someone. And we gotta keep an open mind and do research and ask the right questions knowing that we're just gonna continue to build on this, which is why the Rubicon definition of subluxation is gonna be revisited and revisited and revisited as this body of evidence changes and evolves over time. Make sense? So it gets us to ask fundamentally different questions. And here's my, my challenge to you. What would, what would the world be like if we asked different questions? You know, in the Soho district of London back in the 1800s, people were drinking out of the Broad Street well. And they'd all go down to the well and they'd get their water and with time people were becoming sick. Right? The germ theory and bacteria. But complexity would suggest a different question. And the question that complexity would ask would be this one. Why would the people who drank water from the Broad Street well and not get sick? Because a lot of people drank the same water, wouldn't you agree? And didn't become sick. So what was it about their constitution, biologically, physiologically, that allowed them to adapt to that external cholera bacteria and not become ill. I think if we had asked that question, we'd have an extremely different healthcare system in place right now. And I would argue that it would be a vitalistic healthcare system looking at how the body is self-conscious, self-organizing, self-maintaining, and self-healing. Because they're different perspectives. So let's bring it home. What is it, for instance, What's the difference between mental health and mental illness? What do vitalistic health outcomes look like? I mean, if it's not hypercholesterolemia, and it's not high blood pressure, and it's not blood chemistries, and it's not all the stuff that happens in Western medicine, then what's a vitalistic health outcome look like? This is a rhetorical question, because I'm not sure, folks, we have an answer to that one, right? So there's a guy by the name of Corey Keyes. He works out of Emory in positive psychology, and he talks about mental health, and he works with Life University in her positive psychology program. And he's an expert in mental flourishing. And we can sit there and go, well, mental health, you know, schizophrenia, bipolarism, all these types of things, and there's all these metrics that identify people so they can prescribe and provide clinical care to them. And his argument was, that's fine, but those indicators have nothing to do with indicators of mental flourishing. None. So if we want to promote flourishing, of mental health, we have these 13 other parameters and dimensions that we need to look at and measure because those are more important to healthy mindset than it is to ill health. That's happening right now here in Atlanta. Fascinating conversations, but collectively we need to have that as a profession. Here's something I wanted to share with you because it just came out last September. It scares the hell out of me, by the way. Maybe Dr. Wakefield can speak to this. This came out of Christopher Gill at Boston University Public Health. The disease of whooping cough is back because we didn't really understand how our immune defenses against whooping cough could work and how the vaccines needed to work to prevent it. Instead, we layered assumptions upon assumptions and now find ourselves in an uncomfortable position of admitting that we may have made some crucial errors. 
I mean, I, that to me hits the whole conversation home about where we're at and why this conversation that we're having here today at the Rubicon is so fundamentally important moving forward. I want to share something with you. I'm not going to go through all these, but here's the point. We are at a crossroads in our communities, folks. There has never been a time when people have needed what we have to offer more than they do today. You know, I've been around chiropractic for 30 years and I've heard it since I was a student, there's no better time to be a chiropractor than today, right? And I used to go, oh God, here we go. It used to sound like a sales pitch to me. But here I am saying to you, there's never been a better time to be a chiropractor than today. Never been a better time than today. And the problem we have is this. Right now in this country, every 15 minutes, a child is born suffering the debilitating and often fatal effects of neonatal abstinence syndrome. Through no fault of their own, through drug addicted, alcohol addicted parents, they have debilitating and often fatal lives. Right now in this country, one out of every 82 children is born on some level of autistic spectrum disorder. And it's predicted that by 2050, 32 years from now, within all your professional careers, that if the incidence rate of this goes unchecked, that we don't control it, half of all children are gonna be diagnosed with severe neurocognitive disorders. And in case you've been living under a rock, the United States is in the midst of the single biggest drug epidemic in its history with opioids. Opioids are now killing more people under the age of 50 than cancer, automobiles, and the height of the AIDS epidemic. And unfortunately, we're sitting here in Atlanta and Cobb County in the heart of the heroin triangle in the South that was featured recently on the news. It is an equal opportunity destroyer of lives. We have a serious drug issue in this country. And the sad part for me is that 50% of the people who are on opioids are there because they were being used for neuromusculoskeletal conditions, right? So we are literally killing our children. I don't want to sound dramatic about that, but there has never been a time when our communities have needed what you have to offer more than there is today. So to come to the Rubicon and be a part of this collective like-minded group who are committed to being out there and making a difference because you're the only ones who can, who are committed to carrying this message to their communities, whether their communities want to hear it or not is important and you're the only ones who can. Because we have a dream to change the lives of everybody on this planet, to provide them an opportunity of hope so that they can approach their health with choices not exclusions, but choices. And that dream is alive in this room. And it's certainly alive here in Atlanta. I'm privileged to be the president of Life University. You know, in 1974, this institution was founded on a dream, a dream to bring different way of looking at health to people through lasting purpose and the innate principle. And we're all committed to that to this day. James Allen, the author of As a Man Thinketh, has a quote. I use it all the time. He says, the greatest accomplishments are but first a dream. The mighty oak rests in the acorn, the bird sleeps in its egg, and in the greatest vision of a spirit, a waking angel stirs, because a dream is a seedling for reality. We're all here today planting the seed for a better life, and I'm just so honored to be able to do it with you, and I thank you for being here supporting the Rubicon, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.